Sutra, wishing to benefit the world, he single-mindedly seeks after Bodhi, constantly answering the Dharma nature. He entertains no discrimination. He observes that all things in the world are quiescent and devoid of an intrinsic nature. Yet he constantly benefits beings, cultivating with an unwavering resolve. He neither dwells in the world nor separates himself from the world. Relying on nothing in the world, he is nowhere dependent. Commentary: Wishing to benefit all sentient beings in the world, he single-mindedly seeks after Bodhi, the unsurpassed path to Bodhi to Buddhahood and enlightenment. Although the Bodhisattva benefits all beings in the world and seeks the unsurpassed path, he is constantly answering the fundamental substance of the Dharma nature. What is the fundamental substance of the Dharma nature? It is the absence of discrimination. Thus, while he entertains no discrimination, he accomplishes the path of Bodhi. He observes that all things in the world are quiescent and devoid of an intrinsic nature. Yet, he constantly practices the Bodhisattva path and benefits all beings, cultivating with an unwavering resolve. When the Bodhisattva cultivates the six paramitas and myriad practices, the Bodhisattva path is cultivating samadhi. Samadhi is being unmoved in the midst of movement. Movement is stillness. Stillness is movement. Movement and stillness are one. They are non-dual. Why? Because the Bodhisattva is free from all attachments. We who cultivate often misunderstand. And think that we can develop samadhi through stillness. Actually, being calm and stillness is not as skillful as being calm in movement. If you lack samadhi in the midst of movement, you still will be influenced by your internal and external states. Don't make the mistake of delighting in emptiness and clinging to stillness. Cultivation requires that we cultivate stillness within movement and movement within stillness. Movement is stillness, and stillness is movement. Movement and stillness are not two different states. If you say, "I like to be still and I don't like to move," then you are attached to stillness. If you say you prefer action to stillness, then you are attached to movement. Whether moving or being still, you should be in samadhi. What kind of state is that? It described by two lines I often quote. The eyes see forms, but inside there is nothing. The ears hear sounds, but the mind does not know. In other words, when you awaken to what you see, you transcend the world. When you are confused by what you see, you sink and flounder. Samadhi is not realized only in stillness. The samadhi that develops during movement is even more genuine and useful. Cultivators must attain a state of perfect. An abstracted harmony. This is what cultivating with an unwavering resolve means. This unwavering resolve is also known as the unmoving mind. Mencius was forty before he attained an unmoving mind and had some samadhi. Kao Tzu attained an unmoving mind earlier than Mencius, so Mencius said, "Kao Tzu preceded me in achieving an unmoving mind." The unmoving mind is synonymous with the unwavering resolve. He neither dwells in the world nor separates himself from the world. He is attached neither to worldly dramas nor to transcendental dramas. Relying on nothing in the world, he is nowhere dependent. You won't be able to find any attachments, for the bodhisattva is not attached to worldly or transcendental dramas. Sutra. He comprehends the nature of the mundane, yet is undefined by and unattached to it. Without relying upon the world, he transforms and liberates those in the world. He completely knows the intrinsic, intrinsic nature of all the dharmas in the world. He understands that dharmas are non-dual, yet to non-duality he attaches not. His mind neither lives the mundane nor dwells in the mundane. It is not beyond the mundane that he cultivates all wisdom, like a reflection in water. Neither inside nor outside, the Bodhisattva, in quest of Bodhi, understands that the world is not the world. 
He neither dwells in nor transcends the mundane, for the mundane is beyond words. He is neither within nor without, appearing in the world like a reflection. Commentary: He comprehends the nature of the mundane. The Bodhisattva understands the intrinsic nature of every worldly drama, yet is undefined by and attached to it. Having severed the attachment to self and to dramas, he is unattached to any worldly drama without relying upon the world. He transforms and liberates those in the world, while not relying on worldly dramas. The Bodhisattva teaches and transforms all sentient beings in the world. Enabling them to leave suffering and attain happiness, he completely knows the true, intrinsic nature of all the dramas in the world. He understands that all dramas are non-dual, yet to non-duality he attaches not. The Bodhisattva is not attached to the non-dual drama of the primary truth. His mind neither lives the mundane nor dwells in the mundane. The Bodhisattva does not live worldly dramas. Nor is he attached to the world. It is not beyond the mundane that he cultivates all wisdom. He does not seek all wisdom outside worldly dramas. Rather, he cultivates the transcendental drama, right within mundane dramas. He is in the world yet transcends the world. It is as easy as turning you hand your hand over. Before turning, you see the back of the hand. Once you turn it over, you see the palm. This is the same principle as afflictions being body. When you don't cultivate and fail to understand things as they really are, you have afflictions. When you understand, those afflictions are simply body. Body is not outside of afflictions; rather, body is right within afflictions. Afflictions are body, and body is afflictions. If You know how to turn affliction around. It is body. If you don't, it is still affliction, like a reflection of the moon in water. Neither inside nor outside. Would you say the moon's reflection is in the water or outside the water? It is neither. The Bodhisattva in quest of body, the unsurpassed, proper and perfect enlightenment, understands that the world is not the world. He understands that the world is empty, and so the text says he is not the world. All worldly dramas are empty. He neither dwells in nor transcends transcend the mundane. He is attached neither to worldly dramas nor to transcendental dramas, for the mundane is beyond words. The world is empty and ineffable. He is neither within the world nor without. Appearing in the world like a reflection, the Bodhisattva appears in the world like the reflection of the moon on water. Sutra entering this profound meaning, he leaves defilement and gains total clarity. Yet he does not forsake, for his original vow to be wisdom's lamp shining on all. The world has no boundaries, yet his wisdom infuses it to capacity. He transforms flocks of beings everywhere, enabling them to cast out all attachments. Commentary: Entering this profound meaning, the Bodhisattva understands the profound analogy. He contemplates that all things are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, and shadows, like dewdrops and lightning flashes. One should contemplate them thus. The Bodhisattva's wisdom is pure, so he leaves defilement and gains total clarity. He shines like a brilliant crystalline light that penetrates inside and out. Yet he does not forsake his original great vow to be wisdom's lamp shining on all in the Dharma realm. The world has no boundaries, yet his wisdom infuses it to capacity. The Dharma realm and the world are about this. If you have great wisdom, you can enter these boundless worlds and be equal to them. In these boundless worlds, he transforms the meatless flocks of beings everywhere, enabling them to cast out all attachments. Sutra, contemplating the profound drama, he benefits the multitudes of beings, leading them to enter wisdom and cultivate every path to enlightenment. The Bodhisattva observes all dramas. Realizing that they are all like conjured effects, yet he undertakes practices resembling conjured effects. 
never forsaking them to the very end. In accord with the nature of conjured effects, he cultivates the body path. All dharmas resemble conjured effects, so do the bodhisattvas' practices. Commentary contemplating the profound drama of wisdom, he benefits the multitudes of beings, leading them to cultivate and answer great wisdom and cultivate every path to enlightenment as practiced by all Buddhas. The Bodhisattva observes and carefully ponders all dharmas, realizing that they are all like illusion and conjured effects, yet he undertakes practices resembling conjured effects never forsaking them to the very end. He never gives up practicing the Bodhisattva path. In accord with the nature of conjured effects, he cultivates the Bodhi path, he cultivates all paths to enlightenment without becoming attached to any. All dharmas resemble conjured effects, constantly undergoing changes, so do the Bodhisattva's practices. He does not take them too seriously. And it turns out, the sense here is that he does the practices but does not attach to them. He spends his days going along with the natural course of things, being content with his lot and doing his share of work. Sutra, everything in all worlds and karma without measure are equally like conjured effects, dwelling ultimately in creation. All Buddhas in the three periods of time resemble conjured effects in every way. Cultivating myriad practices based on their vows, they transform into thus come ones. The Buddhas with great compassion liberate and transform sentient beings. Such liberation is also like a conjured effect. By their transformative power, the Buddhas explain the Dharma. Knowing that all mundane things are conjured effects, the Bodhisattva does not discriminate among them. The various distinctions among conjured events result from differences in karma. Cultivating the practices of Bodhi, he adorns the treasury of conjured effects. With the infinite goodies, he adorns it, just as karma creates the world. Commentary The Bodhisattva contemplates how everything in all worlds and the karma and retribution without measure created by sentient beings are equally like conjured effects dwelling ultimately in creations. All Buddhas in the three periods of time, past Buddhas, present Buddhas, and future Buddhas, resemble conjured effects in every way. Buddhas also resemble conjured effects, and thus, you should not become attached to them. To be attached to the Buddhas is equivalent to adding a head on top of the head you already have. You will fail to attain true liberation. Cultivating the Bodhisattvas' myriad practices based on their past great vows, they transform into thus come ones. Completing and perfecting their practices is how the Buddhas become Buddhas. The Buddhas with great compassion liberate, teach, and transform sentient beings. Such teaching and liberation is also like a conjured effect. The Buddhas are working within an illusory realm. By their transformative power, the Buddhas explain the Dharma to all sentient beings. Knowing that all mundane things are illusions and conjured effects, empty, unreal, and unable to provide ultimate happiness, the Bodhisattva does not discriminate among them. He does not discriminate among these false Dharmas. The various distinctions among conjured events result from differences in karma. Sentient beings create karma in their delusion and undergo different retributions. Cultivating the practices of Bodhi, the dharmas leading to enlightenment, he adorns the treasury of conjured effects with infinite boundless good deeds. He adorns it, just as karma creates the world. The world is manifested through sentient beings' delusion, creation of karma and undergoing of retributions. Why haven't we sentient beings attained Buddhahood yet? Everything we do is just a little bit off. If we weren't off by that little bit, we would have become Buddhas long ago. In everything we do, we are one step behind, so we can never catch up. We always miss our opportunity. Even if we bring forth the resolve for Bodhi and cultivate the Bodhi path, we have all kinds of attachments. Originally, we were right on track, 
but then we got ourselves in trouble into trouble so we were offered by that little bit if we could apply ourselves on that little bit we would certainly become buddha soon sutra the drama of conjured effects is beyond discrimination and does not differentiate among dramas both of these are present as are the bodhisattva's practices the sea of conjured effects is understood with wisdom the nature of conjured effects in prince or worlds conjured effects neither come into being nor cease to be the same is true of wisdom commentary the drama of conjured effects is beyond discrimination and does not differentiate among dramas why are there no discriminations the next line says very clearly both of these i.e all dhammas and the nature of conjured effects are quiescent they do not exist as are the bodhisattva's practices the bodhisattva acts with that effort is not attached to any of his practices the sea of conjured effects is understood only by someone with wisdom the nature of conjured effects imprints all worlds conjured effects neither come into being nor cease to be the same is true of wisdom conjured effects are neither produced nor destroyed since they do not exist to begin with wisdom too is unproduced and is destroyed it is originally that way sutra with the tenth patience he sagaciously observes sentient beings and all dharmas how quiescent their essential nature is like the vote belonging nowhere attaining to this vote like wisdom he leaves all attachments behind forever like the vote empty of everything he is unimpeded throughout the world patience in perceiving all as the vote that he achieves his power like the vote is inexhaustible states of being resemble empty space yet he discriminates not as to emptiness commentary with the tenth patience patience in perceiving all as the vote he sagaciously observes sentient beings and all dramas how quiescent and impermanent their essential nature is like the vote belonging nowhere the vote has no location if it had a location it would not be the vote attending to this vote like wisdom he leaves all discriminations and attachments behind forever like the vote empty of everything he is unimpeded throughout the world since the bodhisattva is empty nothing can obstruct him patience is perceiving all as the vote that he achieves his power like the vote he is inexhaustible the power of this patience is as infinite as space states of being resemble empty space yet he discriminates not as to emptiness since he is like the vote what is there to discriminate in the world if it could be discriminated it would not be the void sutra the void has no essential nature it is not subject to annihilation and is absent of various discriminations the power of wisdom is also like this without a beginning the void has neither a middle nor an end equally unfathomable in its expanse is the bodhisattva's wisdom with that he contemplates the nature of all dharmas how everything is like the void not neither coming into being nor ceasing to be that is the bodhisattva's attainment while abiding in the drama of emptiness he still expounds for sentient beings subduing all the demons through the experience of this patience worldly characteristics however different are all empty of characteristics answering that which is uncharacterized he regards all characteristics as equal commentary the void has no real substance and no essential nature the void is a sunyata emptiness and sunyata is the void it is not subject to annihilation so the void is empty and has nothing in it it is not a drama subject to annihilation and yet it is absent of various discriminations the power of wisdom is also like this wisdom is basically invisible yet it cannot be annihilated without a beginning the void has neither a middle nor an end 
equally as fathomable in its expanse is the, the Bodhi, Bodhisattva's wisdom. The Bodhisattva's wisdom is as immeasurable as empty space. With that, he contemplates the nature of all dharmas, how everything is like the void, neither coming into being nor ceasing to be. That is the Bodhisattva's attainment. The wisdom attained by the Bodhisattva is likewise unproduced and undestroyed, while abiding in the drama of emptiness, in the patience of perceiving all as the void, he still respectfully spouse the drama for sentient beings, subduing all the celestial demons and externalists through the experience of this patience. Worldly characteristics, however different, are all empty of characteristics. Once you understand, you see that all attributes are empty and without substance. Entering that which is uncharacterized, attaining the Dharma of the uncharacterized, he regards all characteristics as equal. Once you understand the, the uncharacterized, you re realize that there is nothing it fails to characterize. As it is said, the characteristic of reality is uncharacterized, yet there is nothing it fails to characterize. It is the same as empty space. Sutra, he uses a single expedient to universally answer all wounds. He knows the dramas of the three birds of time to be equal in their world like nature. His wisdom, his voice, the Bodhisattva's body, the nature is void like, completely quiescent. Commentary, he uses the, a single expanding drama to create innumerable transformation bodies in order to universally enter all worlds in the ten directions and teach and transform sentient beings in these worlds. He knows the dramas of the three periods of time to be equal in their void-like nature. The Bodhisattva understands all dramas of the past, present, and future and knows them to be no different from the void. His wisdom, his voice, the Bodhisattva's body, the nature, is void-like, completely quiescent. The Bodhisattva's wisdom, his sounds, his body, are essentially like empty space. They are still and absent of characteristics. Sutra, these ten kinds of patience are cultivated by the disciple of the Buddha, with his mind deftly dwelling in peace therein. He spouse dramas for all sentient beings. Learning them well, well, he achieves great power, the power of Dharma and the power of wisdom, provide experience on his path to Bodhi. Versed in the method of patience, he accomplishes impacted wisdom, excelling the multitudes in turning the unsurpassed Dharma will. His extensive practices are immeasurable in scope. Only the taming teacher's see of wisdom can know them in detail. Renouncing the self for the sake of cultivation, he enters the profound Dharma nature. His mind constantly abides in pure dharmas, with which he ministers to the multitudes. The number of sentient beings endured most in lands could still be reckoned, but no limit to the Bodhisattva's meritorious virtue can be ascertained. The Bodhisattva manages to achieve these ten kinds of patience, his wisdom and practices remain and fathomable to the multitudes. Commentary These ten kinds of patience, the Dharma gateways to wisdom mentioned earlier, are cultivated by the disciple of the Buddha. All disciples of the Buddha ought to cultivate them, with his mind deftly dwelling in peace therein. The Bodhisattva dwells in those ten kinds of patience bearing what others cannot bear, and he espoused these dramas for all sentient beings in great detail. Learning and practicing them well, he achieves limitless boundless great power of wisdom. The power of drama and the power of wisdom provide experience on his path to Bodhi. They serve as initial experience for the Bodhisattva on the path to enlightenment. Versed in the method of the ten kinds of patience, he accomplishes unimpeded wisdom, excelling the multitudes, but for the Bodhisattva's wisdom surpasses the wisdom of all worldly and world transcending beings. He constantly engages in turning the unsurpassed 
wonderful Dharma will. He extensive practices. The Bodhisattva cultivates extensive great practices. We, on the other hand, do a small meritorious deed and consider ourselves terrific. Take a look. The Bodhisattva's extensive practices are immeasurable in scope. How numerous are they? It cannot be known. Only the taming teacher's sea of wisdom can know them in detail. The Bodhisattva's great practices can only be known through the Buddha's oceanic wisdom. Renouncing the self for the sake of cultivation, he enters the profound Dharma nature. His mind constantly abides in pure and defined dramas, with which he ministers to the multitudes. The Bodhisattva uses pure dramas to teach and transform sentient beings. The number of sentient beings and thus most in land could still be reckoned, but no limit to the Bodhisattva's meritorious virtue can be ascertained. No one can measure the extent of the Bodhisattva's merit and virtue. The Bodhisattva manages to achieve these ten kinds of patience. His wisdom and practices remain unfathomable to the multitudes. Human and celestial beings cannot fathom the states of the Bodhisattva's cultivation.